If you have your Bibles, I'd invite you to open up to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We have been working our way through this book. We have two more chapters to go through. Um, and uh, it gets more and more exciting as we go through this. Uh, this is page 928 if you're using the Sanctuary Bible. 928. The book of Thessalonians has been written to a church, a young church, a church where Paul had only spent either, well, three Sabbaths, just over two weeks to four weeks, establishing a church. And they have uh, had questions and issues come up where they have received, uh, Paul had received some information about how the church was doing. And, uh, and with that, he's responding to them. And in this particular passage we're going to look at, there are some uh, very basic things that many of us would say, oh, well, that's kind of a no-brainer. They should have known this. But you know what? In our day and age, we need to hear this message because this is confronting you and me and the church across America, even the world right now. So this is very appropriate for us. So I would invite you to stand with me and, uh, and that's in honor of the Lord's word. And we're actually going to start with verse 11 back in chapter 3, just so we can get the flow of thought that's going on here. So cha uh, chapter 3, verse 11. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you. And may... The Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, as we do for you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, excuse me, I added Christ. Lord Jesus, with all his saints. Now into chapter 4. Finally, then, brothers... We ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you were doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality that each of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in the matter, because the Lord is an avenger, uh, avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this, disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you are doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. And to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for the directness of it. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us instruction in how we are to live in this day and age. Lord, we need your guidance. Lord, we look around and we see this world has gone crazy and full of chaos and conflict. And Lord, you are the Lord of peace. You are the Lord of life. And you want to bestow that on us. And you've given us this book, your words are life. And so we come to you this morning and ask you to reveal to us your life. Lord, we thank you for the way that you are working across the world. Lord, that you are working in the lives of your people and even though there is great persecution, even though there's great conflict, Lord, you are working. 
And we recognize that today is the International Day of Prayer for the Suffering Church. And so, Lord, we do pray for our brothers and sisters abroad, that, Lord, you would sustain, that you would preserve, that you would cause our brothers and sisters across the world that are undergoing great persecution, you would give them boldness. Boldness in your spirit to preach the gospel, regardless of the outcome. And Lord, we are determined even here to preach your truth. We do not want to, uh, Lord, shy away from it. We don't want to diminish your truth. We want to preach your truth and speak your truth in love so that others would know your goodness. So, Lord, here we are with open ears, open hearts. Speak to us this morning, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. If I were to take a little poll around the room and ask you to raise your hand if you have a dog, how many of us would raise our hands? Many of us. Many of us. Or we may have had a dog in the past. You know, there's something about humans. We just love animals. We love dogs particularly because they have this great ability to just love on you regardless, you know. And there comes responsibilities with dogs, isn't there? Uh, you have to feed the dog. You have to clean up after the dog. But one of the things you also have to do is walk the dog. And I have this little dog named Lucy, and we walk this dog. Now, here's a picture of a dog. It's not Lucy, but this dog is very excited. As Lucy gets, as your dog probably gets, to go out for a walk. All you have to do to Lucy is just say, want to go for a walk? And she's dancing all around, and she's just wanting to get out there. And she hates the leash part of it, but she just wants to get out there. And she will go careening in front of us for a long while. Lucy's 11 years old, though. And you know when you get a dog that's been a little old, it gets harder to make that journey and the dog slows down and flops down. And you've seen this, and our little Lucy will just drag behind us, you know, and, and it gets really hard. You know, we look at this illustration, we say, this is like our Christian experience. When we first come to the Lord, man, we are all into it. We got, we're pulling at the leash. Come on, let's get going. This is great. And then as time goes on, we kind of flop down like this little puppy. And it gets hard to get up. And we lag behind. That's what was happening with the church of Thessalonica. They had been undergoing persecution. The resistance from the people around them. They had seen it happening directly to Paul and Silas and Timothy, and it was happening to them to have this constant resistance, plus all the newness was wearing off of the Christian life. And so we get into the same pattern. We get into the same flow of things where we just get kind of tired, don't we? And I say we because it's all of us. It's a common Christian experience. Paul has words here to say to us. And, and it, the, the words are to pick up the pace. To pick up the pace. There's two times where you see the phrase, um, and I'll read it here in, in verse uh, 1. Do so more and more. You're doing well, keep going. The New American Standard Version says, excel still more. In other words, you're doing well, keep going. And Paul's just cheering them on. He's saying, pick up the pace. Put 110% into it. Well, our main point for today is that while we may have experienced significant changes in our lives since we became Christ followers... We're urged to apply ourselves to a much greater extent. 
There's, a, there's a, an active part of this Christian life that you and I need to understand that we have. We have a responsibility to do things. The Lord has freed us from the power of sin. He's given us his new life. And now, as time goes on, he's saying, keep pushing on. Uh, Paul talks in, in uh, Ephesians about putting off the old self with its lusts and and, and ungodly desires and put on the new self which has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. We have this responsibility to take off and put on. Take off old behaviors, put on the new behaviors. And this is what he's getting to. You know, earlier in Thessalonians, Paul was exhorting us to walk in a manner worthy of God. The walk, the behavior, the everyday lifestyle. To walk in a way that reflects how much God is worth for us. And we looked at that a few weeks ago. And it was that balance that God, we look at at one end and who he is. And that, of course, just takes the scale and just totally uh, dumps it down. And we have to walk in a way that reflects how worthy he is, how great, how magnificent he is. And that's what we're called to do, to walk in a, a manner worthy of the Lord. Now let's look at verses uh, one and two here. Finally, brothers, finally kind of means furthermore. He's continuing his thought. It doesn't mean it's really the last thing he's going to say because obviously he's got two more chapters here. Um, It's a preaching tool, right? Just keep people involved. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge. Notice that he's asking, he's pleading, he's urging them. This is what you need to be focused on in the Lord Jesus. And notice how he's urging them. Because I said so. No, Paul isn't using his own authority, but he's saying, in the Lord Jesus, I'm urging you because of who he is, just as you received from us, how you ought to walk and please God. It's how we ought to behave, order our lives, the priorities that we have, and to please God. It's not pleasing God to earn salvation, not at all. It's pleasing God because we're saved. It's from a position of salvation that I want to please him. I want to do things that once I didn't want to do. And that's what he's saying here. That just as um, you, that you ought to walk and please God, just as you were doing, he notices that they're doing it. He's giving, giving them an attaboy, girl. You're doing great. But you do so more and more. Keep it going. Urging them on. You got to keep going. Don't give up now. For you know what instructions we gave, uh, gave you through the Lord Jesus. And he had spent that time with them. Saying, this is how your lifestyle ought to be. This is what you need to focus on. This is where you need to be going as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we see... In verses 3 through 12, you have it broken down into three different areas that are very particular to the Thessalonican church, but it's also very appropriate to you and me living in the United States in Grants Pass, Oregon in 2023. The first thing has to do with sexual purity. The second thing has to do with brotherly love and love for each other. The third thing has to do uh, with uh, the way we relate to the society around us and what we're to be involved in. So first, let's look uh, at the first one. We are to walk in sexual purity. The first thing we see here in verse 3, this is the will of God. Have you ever wanted to know the will of God? Oh yeah, I want to know what God wants for me. Well, here it is, black and white. Okay, this isn't the complete will of God, but take this one and apply it. There's several times in in scripture, it says this is the will of God. Great, okay, pick it up. Uh, There's plenty of other places where this is the will of God and we have to kind of mine this out. What are the principles? What are the thoughts that God is trying to uh, uh, convey to us about his desires? This one's black and white. This is the will of God, your sanctification. Sanctification. Hagiamos. It means holiness, purity. It means you're set apart from sin 
and set apart to God. This is holiness. And you and me, the Thessalonians, were called to sanctification. Every Christian has been called to be holy to God. And this is where we tend to forget about this one. We tend to put it on the back burner. You know, because why? It means a change of mindset, a change of lifestyle, a change of behavior. What does he say here? The first thing we ought to see, holy living is God's will. God's will is the ultimate aim for the Christian. You know, this doesn't, uh, shouldn't come as a surprise for any of us. Because it's been throughout the entire scripture, back in the Old Testament, when Moses was speaking uh, to the children of Israel, and in the book of Leviticus, setting up the, 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 the Levitical laws, we read in, in verse, or chapter 11, verse 45, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Speaking to the people, you shall be holy, and God is saying, because I'm holy, because of the nature of God, you are serving me, you are my holy people, and therefore your lifestyles should reflect who I am, God is saying. Well, that was the Old Testament, wasn't it? Huh, we don't have to, yeah, we do. In First Peter, toward the end of the book, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, not compartmentalize and say, I can be holy at church. I can be holy when I'm around Christians and then not elsewhere. No, in all your behavior, be holy. So... Continuing on as we read, it's interesting. What is not being holy? Well, if you look in verse 5, it says, well, let's, let's read 4 too. That each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor. Notice that's the same word as sanctification. Sanctification, holiness here in verse 4. And in verse 7, that you were called in holiness. So it's, it's a common theme through this. And he, why is he saying this to the Thessalonians? The Thessalonians lived in a culture that was over-sexualized. Uh, from the Greek culture, remember this is Macedonia, which would be northern Greece. They had the influence of the Greeks that had gone on for some time, plus they had been taken over by the Romans. So they had the Roman influx, and it was a Roman uh, major city, so there was a, a great uh, cultural blending there of not so good things. Uh, in the common household, it was uh, notable that uh, a husband would have a wife and for the purpose of having legitimate children. And then he would have a concubine or other ladies to have affairs with for pleasure. And then probably have some prostitute relationships that, that they were involved in. In the Roman culture, it was very common to have a young boy to have relationships with for the man. Now, we look at this and say, oh, that's crazy, man. Those guys were messed up. All we got to do is pop our head up above the, the, the room here and we look out in the world and you know what? That's our culture. That is our culture. There are no mores, no morals, no, no, no boundaries that are set in our culture for sexual relationships. And that is why Paul's saying here, this is the will of God, your sanctification your sanctification, and he makes it clearer in saying that you abstain from sexual immorality. Abstain, that means not participate, not go there, shut off, you got to stop this. Sexual immorality. A word in the Greek is porneia. Porneia. What does that mean? Well, it's a, actually, it is a kind of umbrella term 
for anything that is involved in a sexual activity that is outside of God's design. Holy living includes sexual purity. Sexual immorality, something very different. What would that include? That would include fornication, which would be sex before marriage. Adultery, sex outside of the marriage. It would in, include pornography, being excited and stimulated by visual pictures. And it would also include homosexuality, as well as it's a general term. That's pretty much our culture today. We live in that over-sexualized society. Now sex and sexuality really there's nothing wrong with it. It was created by God. It was created to procreate, to have children, to, to people the earth. It was created for unity and intimacy between a husband and a wife. And it was created, frankly, for pleasure. There's no getting around it. But what's happened? Sin the evil one has taken this and warped it. And, and we have become, as a people, consumed by the idea and the concept of it. Sex, as we read in the Bible, and we're not going to get into all the ifs, ands, or uh, reasonings that are scriptural, but to quickly define, sex is only to be engaged in between a man and a woman in the context of marriage. And should I say, to make it even clearer, it is in the context of marriage between a biological man and a biological woman. Those things are needed to be said. Now here's the thing. I, I'm gonna, I, I hear the rumblings. I hear the, we need to be careful. We need to be sensitive. We see the truth. We want to stand behind the truth. But there is a world that is around us that doesn't see that. And so we have to check our hearts. We really do. You know, are we, are we standing up and waving our flag and getting mad at everybody else? And is that going to draw them to the Lord? Yeah, I, I'm glad you see that. You know, it is, it is a, something that we just have to check ourselves. Are we drawing people to the Lord by our response? Is it out of love and care and compassion? Now... It is clear in scripture that sex out of the context of uh, marriage is not God's design. It is wrong, it is sin, it is offending God, and it is hurtful to others. One of the things that we probably ought to understand about our bodies and our spirit, we are not just a body. We are a spirit that has a body. We are a spirit from God. We relate to him. He has made us alive in him, and we have this vessel called a body. I've done far too many funerals where you see the body there without the spirit. It is a shell. It is a mechanism that is working that the spirit works in. And so that changes things quite a bit in the way we relate to this world around us. We are not dictated by the, the, the desires of our body, the needs of our body. We should be dictated to by our spirit that's in communion with God. So we look at our bodies. I want you, I want you to turn to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5, this is possibly one of the first books in the New Testament written. Um, and uh, toward the end of this, P 
Paul is delineating the difference between the fleshly part of us, the fleshly desires that we have within our body, and then the Spirit of God working in us. And we're going to put in at verse 16, chapter 5, this is uh, page 916 if you're using the, the uh, Bibles here in the sanctuary. And Paul says this, but I say in verse 16, walk by the Spirit. Notice Spirit is capitalized. That's walk by the power of the Holy Spirit of God, by his power, by his, his direction. Walk by that Spirit. Order your life by the Spirit. Boy, this sounds like a common theme that we've been hearing in Thessalonians. And you will not gratify or satisfy or, or uh, feed into the desires of the flesh. The desires of the flesh. That fleshly nature that we have in, in each one of us to do the wrong thing. And we'll get into that in just a minute. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to one another, to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. So there's a, there's a war going on within us, the, the fleshly des desires and the spirit of God that wants to work righteousness through us. We have this opposition. And verse 18, if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Being led by the spirit, controlled, directed by the spirit of God. Now, this is where we need to get to. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Other translations would say the deeds of the flesh. That it's the way the flesh works out, shows itself in our lives. They're evident, okay? What's the first one? Sexual immorality, same word, pornea. Sexual immorality, impurity, same word that's being used there in, in Thessalonians, sensuality. And then it goes on and adds a whole bunch of other spices to this. Idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries. None of us have seen any of these in action before. I know that. <laughs> Divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, another one so, uh, associated with these sexual immorality, and things, what? Like these. This is not a complete list, guys. This is, this, is, this is an ongoing thing. There's a whole lot of other deeds that are out there. In other words, he's saying, you get the picture. You get the picture, all right? But notice the role that the deed of the flesh, is sexual immorality plays. It's, it's first on the list that he writes. We have that in us to do this. The flesh inclines itself to sexual immorality. Now the deal is we're able to live in purity. We are. When Jesus Christ gave us his life as we accepted him and we have become a new creation, the power of sin was eradicated in our life. You are no longer slaves to sin, believe it or not. But why do I keep doing this? Which dog are you feeding? Maybe I shouldn't call the Holy Spirit a dog. But that was the old picture that the old chief would give, you know, which, which one wins? Well, it's who are you feeding? And if we feed the flesh and we're doing that on a consistent basis, that's what's going to come out. I used to tell the kids when I was uh, an administrator at a high school, Christian high school down in uh, California, I said, if you hang out next to a barbecue, you're going to smell like a barbecue. <laughs> That's just common sense, right? You're going you're to start picking up the flavors, the actions, the behaviors of whatever you're hanging around. <sighs> so th the issue is, are we walking by the Spirit? Are we walking by the flesh? The fruit of the Spirit. Check this out in verse 21. The fruit. Now, it's interesting. Fruit is, think about a tree, an apple tree. It has leaves, roots, 
a trunk, stems, and it's living its life, making food for itself with the leaves and photosynthesis. I'm talking fourth grade science here, you know, that's about as far as I get. And what happens in the springtime? The buds come, the fruit comes. Did Mr. Apple Tree actually have to think about, I'm going to produce an apple on the end of my limb? No, because of the nature of the tree and the health in it, it's going to produce apples naturally. So the fruit of the Spirit, that which comes out of a Christian's life, a believer's life, is that which comes naturally because you're rooted deep in the Spirit of God, and the fruit of the Spirit is what? What's the first one? Love. It's love. That comes in later in our passage. Love is what comes out naturally. And it's characterized by what? It's characterized by joy, by peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and what's that last one? Self-control. None of us like that word. Self-control. I want to do what I want to do. That's the fleshly nature. You can't tell me what to do. I'm American. I have my rights. You can't tell me what to do. Until my wife speaks and I say, yes, ma'am. <laughs> I'm not stupid. <laughs> Much. <laughs> The deal is here, we have, while we may have an inclination, a bent, a propensity to do the deeds of the flesh, we do not have to. It is the Spirit of God who wants to work in us, and as we allow him, as we, we give him sway in our life, as we feed our minds on the word of God, our thinking changes. And if you're thinking about Romans 12, 1 and 2, that's where you need to go in your thinking. That we're not to be conformed to this world, but we're to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And that's through the word of God on a daily basis. And it will change the way we act each and every day. And we present our bodies as a living sacrifice to the Lord. That's where we need to be. That's what Paul's saying through this whole thing. But we make excuses. The world makes excuses, and you know what? Here's the problem. We pick up their excuses. We start using them. Well, everybody's doing it. I should be able to do that. I can't help it. Yeah, no, seriously, that's one of the ones I have here. God made me this way. That is... You can't prove that through Scripture. You are a new creation. You are created in holiness and righteousness of the truth. So this sexual immorality that even church members get involved in, we cannot allow that to be what we live by. We can't allow that to influence us. The world has its ways. We can't change the world. You know, I, we really can't. The Lord's going to change the world. We can be the witnesses and the light and the salt and the light in the world, but we can't change the world. That's God's business. Everybody's doing it. It's none of your business. Oh, this is private. Isn't that an excuse we've heard? Yeah, this is private. Or uh, boys will be boys. Here's one. But I love the person. Right? But it's not necessarily healthy for you. It's not righteous. I love frozen burritos, but it's not so healthy for me, okay? I can't be partaking of that. I love sugar, but as a diabetic, that's probably not the best thing for me. But the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. He's broken the power of sin and death in our life, and we need to pray, Lord, have that come out of my life, that self-control. Let me reorder my life according to your word. 
It sounds a lot like uh, Psalm 119. You read through that. And, and it's all about the word impacting our lives, changing the direction of our lives, and falling in love with his word. I'm not hurting anywhere. And how's that for an excuse? I'm not hurting. This is between consenting adults. Well, if you uh, flip back to uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and you look at uh, verse 6. We're not to act in verse 5 in the passion of lust like the Gentiles. Gentiles would be unbelievers who do not know God. That no one transgress and wrong his brother. Brother could be brother or sister. But transgress is to go beyond the line, to cross the line. And it's very easy to do that when we're in a relationship where we know we're not supposed to be. To cross the line and we're defrauding our brother or sister in the Lord. The, that's serious, serious things. And, and notice what he says, because the Lord is an avenger. The Lord's serious about his word, his name, his reputation. He's serious about his children. And if we were to defraud, if we were to transgress and wrong a brother or sister, that's a place we don't want to be. Because the Lord is an adventure. And I'll leave that at that. So holy living truly is possible. You know, First uh, Cor uh, Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. If you don't know that one, memorize it. First Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God, who is faithful will not let you be tempted beyond what you were able, but with the temptation will provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Isn't that a beautiful statement? We can't say, oh, it was too much for me. I can't. No, God says here, there's no temptation that's overtaking you. It's common, but God will provide a way of escape. Oh, I didn't see the escape. Why? Because you were looking at that problem too much. You weren't looking at God. And I can say that because I've done that way too many times. God is faithful. And when we resist the enemy, resist Satan, resist the temptation and draw near to God, yeah, we got the power. Why? Because he lives within us. Some basics to holy living. And we got to go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, that's page 898 if you're using the Sanctuary Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul was writing the book of 1 Thessalonians from the city of Corinth, which is in southern Greece. Achaia would be the province. And he, that, it, was a, it was a very immoral city. In fact, outside of the city was a high outcropping of rock a couple of few hundred feet high, and on top was a temple. And uh, the temple uh, keepers there uh, were prostitutes. And they would come down into the town at night. They would ply their trade to earn money to keep the temple going. And the people of the town thought that this was the way to honor their gods. Okay, so they had this all around in their culture. So here Paul writes in chapter, um, chapter 6, verse 18, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. Wow. Let's take that and dissect it a little bit. I'm going to kind of go backwards with it. You see the, the uh, verses on the screen. First thing, I think, uh, for basics to holy living, realize that you do not own yourself. You do not own yourself. Look where it says, um, you are not your own. You were bought with a price. Glorify God in your body. You're not your own. Well, that goes against everything that we hear of from the world. My body, my choice, right? You hear that? 
And so, so with what Paul is saying here, what God is saying to us is you really are not your own. You have been purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ and you belong to him. If we get that through our, <laughs> through our thick skulls, <clears throat> that will help us a lot because the problem is we think that we're in control of our lives on every decision. And that's where we keep shooting ourselves in the foot. And many of us have made the same decisions over and over again. And, and we're feeling the effects of that in our lives. We do not belong to ourselves. The second thing, know that your body houses the Holy Spirit. Or do you not know, verse 19, that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? Remember, we talked about the body and the Spirit. The Holy Spirit comes to reside within the believer. For you were dead in your trespasses and sins, but you have been made alive in Christ Jesus. His Holy Spirit comes to indwell us, to live, to, to, to uh, lead us and guide us in his ways as we allow him. It is a temple, a holy place. He's here to control as we allow him to. He's here to lead through all of the decisions of life He's here to comfort us as a paraclete, as we read in, in the Gospel of John. We have the Holy Spirit within us. And the third thing that I see here, now, I, I'm not a rocket scientist, but I think I can get to, to this point in understanding. The third thing was, get out of there. Stop it. Fix it. Beginning in verse 18, flee from sexual immorality. That's about as clear as it gets. Flee means to get out, run. Think of Joseph in the Old Testament in the book of Genesis when Potiphar's wife was really, really making those advances at him and saying, come on, we're going to have a good time here. And he basically slips out of his clothes because she's got a hold of him. He keeps running and it may have been naked. He saw that it was extremely important to get out of there. Flee. Do everything you possibly can to get out of the situation. Uh, Romans 13, first part of verse, or second part of verse 14, says, Make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. And that's one of the problems we have, is that we make provisions. Oh, you know, I got this problem, but you know, I'll keep the computer turned on just a little longer and let my wife go to sleep. I'll make this little provision here. I'll go and talk to so-and-so at the water cooler because yeah, I think there's a little something going on when you know you're wearing the ring. And it gratifies the flesh. And scripture says here, make no provision for the the flesh. Get out of the situation. Get out of the situation. I say stop it. Get out of there. Stop it. Stop what you're doing. That's the best way. I also say fix it. Because there are some times where it just needs to be fixed. Humble yourself before the, hand, the mighty hand of God that you might find healing, that he might exalt you at the right time, the proper time. Everything done in God's timing is perfect. But the problem that we have as human beings is that we tend to push against him. We tend to want to have our own way. So we see here that this is some really good stuff out of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're going to go back there and finish this, uh, this section up. But we're to walk in holiness, sexual purity in all things. 
And let God speak to you, because I mean, we all go through it. And I know, I know, we have a lot of people here that say, oh, "I got a gray hair," and and you know, it's been a long time since since that was even a problem. You know what? It's all between the two ears. That's really where it is. It's the mindset. It's it's where we're focusing our attention, and that's why that's why in in Romans chapter twelve verse two it says, "Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind." Change the way your mind. You can't change your heart. You can't do that. That's God's work. You can change your mind. And if you change your mind, get it brainwashed, get it, get it pure in its thinking through the word of God, then God's going to change your heart. So the second big thing that we see here in verses 9 and 10 is that we're to walk in demonstrative love. I love that word, demonstrative, because that means you're demonstrating, you're showing it. It's going to show out. You know, and, and so let's read the verses 9 and 10. Now concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you. For you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that indeed is what you're doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you brothers to do this more and more. So they knew about brotherly love. They, they were to be good at brotherly love. They were good at brotherly love. And that's the exhortation for us. Be good at brotherly love. So what's brotherly love? Well, you, you may recognize the Greek word for this, Philadelphia. And it, that's the city of brotherly love, which they need to work on. Um, but it's an affection that we have for between siblings. Now, you may not have had a great relationship with your sibling. I know that. That happens. But, but the idea is just a real affection and a bond between uh, uh, the brothers and the sisters in the congregation, in the church. That's what there ought to be. And you know what? I see that in us. When there are needs, I see you guys step, stepping up. When, when there are uh, hurt uh, feelings, when there are hurt uh, emotions, when there's a sense of loss from a loved one or, or finances or whatever it is, you guys minister to one another and you come alongside and throw an arm around each other and, hey, how are you doing? How can I help? And you go over to each other's houses. <sighs> That's great. And then that should continue to be. But he says here, now concerning brotherly love, you have no need to, for anyone to write to you, just like you guys, for you've been taught by God. You've been shown by God. You follow his, his way of doing things, but you've been taught by God to what? Love one another. And that word love is different. That's agape. That's the self-sacrificial love that really only comes through God working in our lives. It comes as we see God's self-sacrificial love, which we looked at through communion today. When we see that, we then start applying that same self-sacrificial love to each other, going out of our way to love one another. When the going is tough, when it that person may not be so lovable, are we laying down our lives for that person? That's where it gets a little bit sticky, it gets a little bit hard, and, but it is what we are called to do, and through that, God is glorified. So we keep showing that self-sacrificial love. And notice he says here, Still more and more. Pick up the pace. Come on, don't be laying there on the cement with the leash. Get going. That's what he's saying. Pick it up. Let's get going with this. Keep going. So what is he saying that to? Love. And I encourage you, I encourage myself in every situation to show love. Finally, the third point in verses 11 and 12 that we're to walk in social respectability. For lack of a better way of putting it, that's, that's where I got this. Uh, we're to live lives that are composed, live composed lives. Look at, look at verse 11 there. And to aspire to live quietly 
and to mind our own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent on no one. With here, we see that we're to live quiet lives, tranquil lives, uh, not getting in everybody's business. And that's a, even the second point there, that we're not to be busybodies, but we're to mind our own affairs. Uh, do I need to say anything more about that? Yeah, just be about what you're... You, Today's got enough trouble of its own. You don't need to be into everybody else's trouble, right? Okay? Be there to love, support, care for. Um, but you don't have to be part of every conversation, right? And then it says, work with your hands. Be busy. Be busy. Just stay busy with what God has called you to do. And in that, you're going to be a good example. You're going to be a good example to who? To outsiders. To those who have yet to know Christ you know, C.S. Lewis said this, when we Christians behave badly or fail to behave well, we are making Christianity unbelievable to the outside world. That's an interesting thought. So a lot of that witness does lie on the way in which we behave, the way we interact with each other, whether it's sexual uh, immorality is an issue, whether we're loving one another, whether we're behaving properly, that will impact the world around us. This is some good stuff for us. And I pray that the Lord has spoken to you. I pray, you know, as I went through this, uh, thinking through this this last week, he was speaking to me all over the place in each and every one of these aspects that we are to be holy people set aside for his purposes. And as we're doing that, we need to pick up the pace. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your challenge to us. We thank you, Lord, that you have empowered us by your Holy Spirit for these things. We pray, Lord, that you would open up our eyes Show us where we're not fitting in line with these desires that you have for us, the designs that you have for us. Let us take this very seriously. Because, Lord, these days are numbered. We see the world events uh, seemingly coming to an end here. And, Lord, we want to be lights shining brightly. We want to be vessels that are full of the Holy Spirit bringing light to the world around us. So help us in these matters, Lord. We would ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together.